Hello and welcome to the October 25th, 2023 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. The time is 7.04. Uh, present are myself, Michelle Labby, Alex Hoare, Andre Guevara, Jason Doherty, also Dave Zomek and Aaron for staff. <clears throat> um, absent currently are Bruce and Laura. Oh, I see Bruce in the attendees, so I'm promoting him to panelists. We, we do, in fact, have Bruce. I keep, I keep, okay, there we go. Now can you hear me? We can. Hi, Bruce. Welcome. You got stuck in purgatory over there. That's right. So I actually read purgatory recently mm -hmm. with the other two on either side of it. Mm -hmm. Kind of, uh, kind of an extraordinary story to read and translated from Italian. Mm. Well. <clears throat> Hopefully that wasn't as bad as where you were, or vice versa. All right, let's get started. Um, chair report. Uh, I have no comments today, so I'm going to hand it right over to Dave Z. Um, good evening. Yeah, I'll be fairly brief. Um, I don't have a lot of updates for the commission. Um, good news, we do have a new uh, assistant land manager. Uh, um, Anthony Perez is joining us. He was our summer staff member this this summer and did a wonderful job, excellent job. And we had um, um, an interview process where we have an, had a number of candidates and he was selected. So he is really hardworking. He, he grew up locally, loves the trails, loves Amherst. And he, I believe he started officially about a week ago. So you may have met him out in the field, but uh, he's been at the community gardens at Hickory Ridge, Mount Pollux and everywhere. And so uh, Brad Borderweek, our, our land manager will be uh, training him. Um, there'll be a number of um, uh, certifications that he needs to get to run some of the equipment we have from you know, tractors to um, um, a dump truck to brush hogs and things of that sort and get all checked out on chainsaws and thing, you know, and, and safety, of course, number one. So um, we're excited to be back um, kind of at at um, uh, full full capacity here in terms of our two staff people. And um, yeah, I'll work with Aaron. Uh, I know your next couple of agendas are pretty heavy, but maybe in December or maybe your first meeting in January, we can have Brad and Anthony come in and do kind of an annual um you know, field report. What what were the projects this summer? Clearly, we were down staff, but um, some things were definitely accomplished, and it's a chance for you all to get to know them and to ask them questions about what's happening out in the field. Um, other quick updates, you know, it is that time as we kind of race uh, toward winter. Uh, anybody's guess what kind of winter we'll have, but we will be out there brush hogging fields, um, um, doing equipment maintenance before winter, putting putting some of our equipment away uh, to um, be be uh, well cared for over the winter, but a lot of focus on um, 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 open field mowing. We're also teaming up with um, with Gastro Trust on the on the um, boardwalk down at uh, the Pond Loop Trail. Uh, you all approved that amendment, I think, last meeting or the meeting before. And uh, that work got underway uh, this morning. I think they are putting in the the pilings, if you will, the I'd call them more poles than pilings, I guess, uh, that will support that uh, 110 foot long boardwalk on the Pond Loop Trail there. So if you're out in the field this weekend, it's great weather for them to get that work going. And Brad and Anthony were both working with Luke and another gentleman from Kestrel who I'm blanking on his name right now, Stu. Uh, and the four of them were working out on that. And there'll be a lot of uh, volunteers converging on that site over the next week to 10 days. I think they expect to have it done in about two weeks. So uh, it'll be nice to have that pond loop uh, re reconfigured again so people can use it. So those are the quick updates. Um, a lot of field work 
And uh, with weather like we're we're experiencing, we can get some things done here before the snow flies. So happy to take any questions. If you've seen anything out there or have questions on anything, just let me know. Thanks, Dave. I see on Alex's hand up. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, do what's the status of Puffer's Pond from a water quality standpoint? Um, great question. Um, we do not test Puffer's Pond any longer. We test until about Labor Day. I went a little longer this year um, just because we had such warm weather, but I typically stop testing around Labor Day. Um, you know, the tests are expensive to run, so we don't have a designated budget for Puffer's Pond. That is, you know, I spend a couple of thousand dollars on tests every summer, and that that uh, funding isn't a, yeah, it's not a line item in my budget. It just, um, it just needs to be done. So uh, we stopped testing. I think we are certainly having some staff meetings talking about Puffer's Pond and really kind of saying, um, you know, talking about bringing a group together in January to really look at the the water quality issue in puffers, and and it's time to kind of take a, a more comprehensive look at that upstream, you know, sediments, upstream uh, potential impacts of dogs, of of uh, agriculture, of um, potential um, uh, septic system failures, whatnot. So, um, but that's kind of the status right now. Um, I don't know if people are still swimming there, but um, at this point uh, in our minds, the swimming season is over. So, but um, it was not a good year with all the rain. It was our worst year in terms of the number of times it failed. I don't have that off the top of my head, but I would be surprised if we had one month of uh, uh, safe testing there, safe test results, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay. Um... Let's move on to our review of minutes approval from 10, 11, 23. I think we're just looking for a motion to approve the 10, 11, 23 minutes. Approved. Second. <clears throat> Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Jason. I have an aye. aye. Thanks. Bruce? Aye. Okay. I abstain. I didn't review them. But I think we've got a quorum on that. Okay. <clears throat> Land management updates. Um, so we actually have three in our folders. There was a late coming one. I'm not sure if anybody saw it. Then there was two, one for Wildwood Conservation Area and one for Mount Pollock. So first on the list is Wildwood Conservation Area. Do you see anyone, Aaron, in the attendees that would be representative? Okay, so no. um, did everybody get a chance to look at this one? Show of hands, Bruce? No, I'm sorry, I just say yes. Okay. I read it. <clears throat> no one else? Okay. Um, all right, well, I guess, I, I mean, I read it. Aaron, did you, did you wanna give a, a a two minute on it or should we just i think you're more um, okay yeah. sure so this is a researcher from the university of massachusetts it's a pretty big study um she I mean, we're very grateful for the um she supplied her methodology and a project summary and offered um her permits and she's approved by the animal use committee so she wants to do a community foraging avian study on, um, well, one of her research sites will be Sylvan Woods in UMass and one she's proposing to do at the Wildwood Conservation Area on Amherst Conservation Lands and one elsewhere. So what it basically entails for those of you who didn't read it, they'd be setting up <clears throat> mist nets. I don't, I probably in the early winter, November, um, banding 50 birds, I think. Um, so three bands of the birds, respiratory measures, like doing the measurements on the birds, uh, some kind of respiratory test, inserting a pit tag. So that's like a little piece of metal. And then anyway, I mean, I don't want to go into her methodology, <laughs> um, but 
it would, I guess, I want to draw attention from the to, to the fact that this is a four year study and the applicant is proposing to be, put artificial feeding or bird feeders on conservation properties for five months of the year. Um, so for a total of four years. So I think that my interpretation of the land use policy is that this isn't exactly consistent with both leave no trace, which is what we usually ask of people using our lands, and also introducing artificial food onto a conservation land has sometimes cascade community effects and can um, attract species that wouldn't be there. It could be a trap. It could attract predators, it could attract bears in the winter. So I have concerns about having bird feeders up on our property for five months of the year for four years. Um, that's my position on it. I also think that UMass has other properties that would be um, a very suitable alternative, such as Cadwell Forest and possibly the Orchard Hill woodlot um, which is near their other study site. So um, commissioners, Bruce, particularly, if you reviewed it, do you want to comment on it? Um, it certainly seemed like a reasonable proposal. I didn't take as much into account what you just said in terms of the uh, traction to, uh, of other animals to the, to the bird feeders. I didn't account for that. So I take your point about that. Any other comments? I'm just curious the impact of the um, in, inserting the pit tag, what that entails. Um, I know that the applicant couldn't be here tonight, but I don't know, Michelle, if you have any insight on that. So I don't, I've never done that. Oh, they're also bleeding the birds. So, um, I mean, her her references had a lot of references as to like, you know, the non-lethal effects of these things. I mean, my concern, I've bled birds, I've banded birds, I measured birds. Doing it in the winter is a little different because it's a different kind of stressor and you're holding the bird for a long period of time. But like I said, um, this is all approved by the Animal Use Commi Committee or Commission. So I don't think it's really our place to make judgments on that. Um, I mean, they're like gonna insert a little pit tag and glue the insertion hole. And it's 50 birds, but we have talked as a land use subcommittee about the, you know, um, what kind of impacts to wildlife we're considering on the preserves. Anyway, I see a lot of hands up. So um, I think Dave, go ahead. Yeah, thanks Michelle. Um... Although I didn't, re I didn't review the, the 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 proposal. Aaron and I did talk about this yesterday, and she kind of briefed me on it. And yeah, I don't I don't disagree with some of your concerns, Michelle. I mean, I kind of had some of the same ones. You know, winter banding is a whole different um, a whole different thing. The bird feeders, you know, they they do become attractive to attractive to both other animals, but also to people. I will say that Wildwood Conservation Area, although it seems off the beaten path, I think that was the only area they proposed, right? Is that correct? I could be wrong on that. It's actually a pretty well-used conservation area, and we often have some activities down there that are not really um, consistent with conservation area use. So it's there's more people down there than you think. I think four years is a long time. Um, I would, I guess I would disagree. I, I think a little bit, Michelle, in, in kind of the rigid, inter I find it a little bit more of a rigid interpretation of what research can happen on conservation land. I mean, honestly, you know, one of the reasons Amherst has so much data on wildlife, on, on plants, on everything, is that we're one of the most studied communities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I just want to be a little careful that we not you know, be so kind of um, cut and dry on 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 those on on the kinds of research that can happen. I mean, we know we know about birds, we know about salamanders, we know about snakes. We have some of the most you know some of the largest areas of estimated in priority habitat because we've studied everything in Amherst because of the colleges, in particular UMass. So, um, but yeah, I I kind of agree that UMass has. Orchard Hill, they have Cadwell Forest. They also have the land off of the rifle range off of um off of um uh, Northeast Street that they could do this in. So 
I, I kind of share some of your concerns and maybe this might not be a great fit for conservation land. Thanks, Dave. And um, just to quickly respond to that, um, I agree that we know a lot about our animals, which is informing some of our, you know, new management and planning. Um, one thing I did consider in this is that there's no real um, conservation implications applicable to the management of the conservation lands and Amherst associated with this. So that was something I took into account when sort of providing these comments to you. Andre? Andre, yeah, do you want to I go was, ahead? Uh, I was just trying to figure something out there. I, I was reading through this while we we're talking and um, I see that they're 10... 10 feeders um i you know i don't i'm not a fan of uh of having feeders out there either um it just seems to you know i don't know i'm not i i feel like it's uh putting food out there where uh where birds uh shouldn't be getting it in a sense uh even though there are neighbors out there who put feeders out and so on i've taken all our feeders down uh because of mainly because of bears um and also because they could they could uh you know uh, birds could get uh sick from uh all congregating in the uh in the area of the feeder um so i, I don't know um i'm i'm kind of on the fence on this one so that's my just figured i'd throw that opinion out there thanks andre yeah. alex yep. I was just going to clarify on on a pit tag. A pit tag is uh, the same thing that's in your Easy Pass. So when you go seventy miles an hour under the indicator on UMass, for example, it picks up a signal, for, uh, bounces back from the pit tag that's in the Easy Pass. So in a bird, it's surgically implanted, or in a fish, we use it in fishes, and uh, then they go past an antenna and we can track them. So I'm not quite sure how they're gonna use the pit tags. I didn't read the proposal. All I wanted to do is, is clarify what happens with the pit tag. It is surgically implanted. It's not a big cut in the skin, but it is winter time. And um, it, the, the wound is susceptible to infection. <coughs> I don't know whether they'd have to stitch it or not in fish. Um, uh, depends on the size of the pit tag. They come in a variety of sizes. So that's just clarification on pit tag. Uh, the bird feeder, I, again, don't know if they want to get birds to uh, congregate where their nets are, but there's going to be a bias towards seed eaters unless they mix in suet, and then they'll get insectivores. But... Uh, um, if they're using bird feeders to uh, color, attract birds they want to study, they'll have a bias for the seed eaters. So they have a, a, a specific list of species, black capped chickadee, white-breasted nuthatch, downy woodpecker, and tufted titmouse. All of which are seed eaters or can be. Yeah, so they they were gonna band and pit tag them and then do some measurements on um, how frequently they come in the feeder. So it logs it logs their activity. So, I mean, go ahead and read the study. I, I don't want to try and summarize it. Um, yeah. So maybe they're going to put an antenna, excuse me. Maybe they're going to put an antenna near the uh, bird feeder, and that's how they know who's coming back. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I think the issue here is, you know, the 10 bird feeders for five months of the year on the conservation land. And I think we, you know, I raised my concerns. People have commented, Dave, I see your hand up again. Yeah. I, it, you know, in all the years I've, I've been doing this, I think, I think enough questions have been raised about this one and I agree with them. And I, you know, 10 feeders in that small area, I think it's, I, I would recommend that we ask them to seek other land to do it on, in particular UMass, there are alternatives, right? This isn't the only place. These are very common birds. It's not like they're studying a rare bird. And to your point, Michelle, we're not, we, the town, are not really going to 
gain much data or information that is helpful probably for the management of our land. So I would recommend that we that you vote to say no on this and, and encourage them to use UMass land. Oh, one other point about what Dave just said, there are actually two sites that they are, they already have one other site. There are oh. only two sites in, Ma in Massachusetts or in Amherst and only one site in Nebraska. So if they really want to have three sites, they can find another one. And if they fail to get another one, they still have one in each town or get one in each part of the country. So I don't think it does any harm to say no to it. Thanks, Bruce. Andre? Yeah, I uh, I, I agree, Dave. Uh, Dave. Um, just for clarification purposes, the uh, RFID uh, pit tag that's uh, going to be implanted in them, Alex, will uh, will give um, will be read every time that they go to one of those feeders, and it's also apparently uh, reading their uh, uh, their temperature as well for part of their study. So anyway, but I'm okay. I'm yeah, I think interesting study, I think, given the alternatives offered by UMass and, um, you know, the sort of the, the, the general principles of our conservation lands and the impact of 10 feeders that um, I would recommend that we vote no on this one. Um, so in, unless anyone has any further comments, looking for a motion. To uh, deny, yeah. Um, I'll make a motion to uh, deny CLU 23-12 uh, Songbird Research Wildlife uh, Wildwood Conservation Area. I'll second that. Alex? Aye. Uh, Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Okay. And Aaron, maybe when you relay that information, you could just list some of the alternatives that we consider. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to Mount Pollux. This is for a painting group, um, a daytime landscape painting group. I Hopefully everybody got a chance to look at that one. Um, personally, I don't have any concerns. Alex? Were you going to vote? Oh, sorry. I. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Transitioning back to Mount Pollux. Um, does anyone have any questions about this one? Nope. Okay. Looking for a motion. I'm I move to uh approve a land use application uh, request uh, CLU 23-13 art at Mount Pollux. Second that. Andre on the first, Jason on the second, Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And, and I'm an aye. Um, okay, so do you, do we want to do Kestrel? It came in sort of late, but um, we've yeah, done this I, before. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just give a little backstory on this? Um, sure. So this request came in um, last week, and I didn't really get a chance to check in with Dave on it, but they... Um, you know, Kestrel had applied for this two years ago, and then, um, and they're hoping to do it again. It's it's kind of short notice because they're hoping to to start in early November. So, um, they, I guess, and Dave might want to elaborate on this more. But the Kestrel's been having some conversations about trying to come up with a like a long term solution and not have to have. Um, a land use application every time they do this. Um, but I just submitted it on their behalf so that we could get it in the queue and get it before the commission tonight uh, for consideration since it's happening so soon. Thanks, Aaron. Dave? Yeah, I mean, really briefly, I, I think, you know, the commission approved this two years ago and then they didn't do it, I think. Last year, they had permission to do it, didn't do it for COVID reasons, or I'm not sure why. So I think we were trying to, trying to look at this as kind of a rollover and say, the commission approved it. If it's exactly the same, 
Um, I know we put some conditions on it and I, I can't remember exactly, but I know Michelle, you had some some um, you know uh, guidance on on a few things. I, I don't recall the specifics of that approval, but the thought was, um, you know if 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 the commission approved it two years ago, why wouldn't we do it again? Um, I would like to in the future develop kind of a long-term MOU with with Castrol, their site. They're going to be, uh, they are partners to the town and to the commission and and to conservation, and they're going to be, you know, their permanent home is adjacent to the the pond and the loop trail and the Mount Holyoke Range. So, and I think they want to do this saw what else uh, research long term. So, uh, in the future, we can look at an MOU. But I think in the short term, they wanted to do some banding this this migration season, and I think saw wets if they're not migrating already, they soon will be. So. That that was all I wanted to add. Thanks, Dave. And this is sort of a invitation to certain members of the or the public, but, um, but it's not like a fundraiser. And there's no sort of like money <laughs> involved. I guess that's just my question: is this is this a long term research banding station that we're looking to approve, or is this a fundraising activity for Gestalt Trust? And that's the only concern that I would have about what we what we you know specify in our long term MOU for this. And if that concerns commissioners or if anybody has comments on that, because it it does it has come up in conversations about land use applications is the economic component. Uh, do you want me to address that, Michelle? I mean, oh, if you have an I'll, answer, I'm not sure if it's just something um, we ask them offline. Yeah, we can ask them that offline. And and again, I think this is just for this season, this uh, migration season. Um, and longer term, yeah, we we need to get into some of those details. Um, I think my recollection, and and I didn't get a chance to review their their recent proposal, but it's a, a rollover from two years ago. My understanding was they are part of a larger banding project for saw wet owls. So there was a an ecological um, you know data collection component to this. whether whether they are inviting volunteers or members to come be part of this, they often do that. Um, I don't I don't think they're charging a fee, but you know, donors make or excuse me, members make donations that forward conservation. Um, goals and objectives, including the town. So um, that's kind of all I know at this point, but I think they're just looking for approval for this season and they'd be banding a couple of times in um, November. Yeah. I don't know if they go into early no, uh, December as well. Okay. Anyone have any questions on this? All right. Looking for a motion. To approve the Kestrel Trust for banding on, is it Umbrook area? A Sweet Alice. Sweet Conservation Alice. Area. Conservation area. So moved. Thanks, Bruce. Second. Bruce on the first, Alex on the second. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Nam and I. Okay. Um, next up, notice of intent for Ahmad development. Is it Amhad? Amhad. Amhad. Amherst. Sorry, Michelle. Yeah, sorry. Can we re-emphasize again the change in the when materials are due to the staff <clears throat> prior to the meeting? Thank you, Bruce. Yes, so the materials are due the Wednesday prior to our meeting, so full week before. Starting November 1st, that was our- Starting November 1st. Right. Okay. Okay, moving into hearings. General procedure for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda, five minutes presentation by staff, five minute comments from applicant, five minutes for public comment or two minutes per person, five minutes for conservation commissioners or two minutes each. For revisions, all plan revisions are required by the Wednesday prior to the meeting at noon. 
starting November 1st. And for all presenters, please clearly state your name, the address of the project, who you are representing, as well as if you have preferred pronouns. Okay, first up is a notice of intent um, for AMHAD Development Corp for the construction of a parking lot and detention basin in the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at 28 Greenleaves Drive, Matt 13 D lot 29. And I'm opening this, yes? Yes. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Bylaws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Okay, Erin, do you want to walk us through? Oh, sure. Okay. Um... So the legal ad's been published. We got proof of a butter notification. There was a site visit that was held on, um, I think the date of the site visit is off. I think that was the 20th. Um, we have a DEP file number. There were some comments associated with this. The, all the documents were uploaded to your folder. Um, so there's a couple of things just to make the commission aware of. When um, I was the only one out on the site visit, um, there were some stability issues out on the site. I did notice that there was some erosion happening. And just to give a little background on this, this project was originally, this is the Green Leaves condo um, development, and it was originally permitted back in 2004. The order of conditions expired, and there was a portion of the work that was never completed, um, basically this portion that we're looking at today. Um, the how it was discovered was that we had permitted a, um, a water line um, improvement and and some some work associated with that and a culvert replacement and when we were out doing the site visit um, I kind of stumbled upon this parking area that hadn't been stabilized and so I said you guys need to have a permit in order to finish this and that prompted them to file this permit um, so if you look in the folder, um, I uploaded the photos, there were some stability issues, I can pull those up um, for, for folks to see if that would be preferred. Um, and also I had a, um, some comments, nothing really super substantial. I think my, my biggest concern is that they get the site stable and um, try to get the pictures up so that you guys can see the stability issues that I'm referring to. If you haven't had a chance to look through yet, I'll just flip through them really quickly. Um, <clears throat> so this is like a washout that's coming down and the material was going underneath the um, straw wattles. Um, this is a, a plume of sediment in the um, existing uh, stormwater swale that is co being contributed by the unpaved parking area that's currently unstable. And there was a significant amount of um, erosion around this this pipe, which contributes to the swale. This is just an example of the the area that's um, unfinished, and you can see the erosion coming off of the the hill slope, and also you can see this plume that's settling into the the um, parking area, and that materials what is washing down ultimately into the. Um, the swale. This is the upper area, which has kind of become somewhat revegetated. But there's this unfinished driveway, and this is kind of a bigger picture. The material is coming down this hill, settling here, and then washing down into this this swale in that location. So um, I did communicate with the applicant about this problem, and they have come up with a plan. Which, if you look in the updated um, materials folder for this project on OneDrive, they did come up with a, a plan to stabilize with some stone, create a stone berm, and put in some additional um, straw wattles until this permit is approved to try to temporarily stabilize the situation. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to run through all these because I think I'm probably pushing five minutes already, but I did send these comments to the applicant's representative, um, just kind of buttoning up some some issues on here. Um, there were some missing stamps on the um, revised plan set, on the um, stormwater checklist. Also, um, I asked for an, um, an operation and maintenance log to be filled out, and there was some missing information on the operation and maintenance plan pertaining to the proposed BMPs. I also just would like to get um, 
sign off from the town engineer on this because it is a previously permitted site that's now um, coming back to us and just to get a determination of whether it's grandfathered under the stormwater bylaw. And that's, I'll just leave it there and uh, leave these up in case anyone wants to read them. Is there and Jason, is your hand up? Yeah, just, Aaron, you mentioned the correspondence folder, the new correspondence folder, updated correspondence following site visit. When I click on that, it's empty. Was this the 1A 2023-0826 proposed parking and stormwater management plan? Um, no, but let me, let me, I, I'm not sure. Maybe it just didn't upload all the way and it got, sometimes that happens if it's in the middle of uploading and it gets interrupted, it doesn't get in there, but I'll, I'll make sure that it gets in there and I can pull up the plan so you guys can see it right now. Just give me one second to navigate to it. I'm going to need I'm going to need just a second to um to track it down. If you want to pull Glenn in, I can pull that up while uh, or uh, Glenn Kravoski is the rep and he's in the in the attendees um if we want to pull him in and get him uh get his um presentation while I'm finding this that might be a good idea. I keep trying to promote him to panelist and it doesn't seem to be working. Oh, he's declined. Okay, Glenn, well, no. if you'd like to say anything, just raise your hand. Alex, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, the time to go through um, what Aaron wants to show us. But if the motion is going to be to continue, we'll, we'll be hearing about this again and the project sponsor. Um, is there a need to go into more detail? If uh, if the motion is to continue, you want to weigh in on that, Erin? Is there something well, you should? I mean, it's it's kind of nice to give when we open the hearing, give the applicant an opportunity to present, um, and or if they have any initial responses to any of the questions or concerns that I've raised, but. Um, I don't, it seems like he's having some problems getting into the room. Um, if, if we want to maybe give him another chance to come in and if, if we can't get him in, then maybe. Um, and I, I think he actually declined to come in. So maybe he's just not, not interested in oh. talking. Oh, okay. Um, so maybe we should just move to the motion to continue. Okay. Um, Fair enough. Um, and I'm, I did track those down and I'm just in the process of uploading the documents. So they'll be available um, to the commission in a few moments. Okay. Um, well, I am looking for a motion to continue the AMHAD development core for the construction of a parking lot and detention in basin in the buffer zone to boarding vegetated wetland at 20 Greenleads Drive, map 13D, lot 79 to, um, Aaron, if you've got your hand up. Just in case you want to take public comment since it's the I'm opening sorry. of the hearing, um, just a, a thought. All right. Um, public comment. If anybody has anything to say on this, please raise your hand. I'll keep an eye on it. Okay, Alex, your hand went down. Back up. You have something to say? A second. Okay. I didn't make, I can't make the motion, so I need someone to do it. Oh, I thought you were reading a motion. Mm, I move to continue the public hearing to 11 8 23 at 7 45 p.m. pending uh, receipt of additional required information. Second that. Alex on the first, Andre on the second. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? I see an aye. Jason? Aye. I'm an aye. Okay. 
Okay. Um, next up, notice of intent with the town of Amherst for construction of a handicapped accessible trail system and trail bridges, resource area mitigation, and restoration activities. Work is proposed in bordering veg bordering land of subject to flooding, bordering vegetated wetlands, bank, riverfront, and the buffer zone at 191 West Primary Lane, map 19D, 20A, lots 10 and 59, otherwise known as Hickory Ridge. We're continuing, okay. Um, does Dave or Aaron wanna say anything about this before we move? I, I think the only thing I would add is that we're we're still waiting um, to meet with the Natural Heritage Program. They had some comments on the on the proposed plans, and so Aaron and I have a meeting with them. I believe it's scheduled for next Tuesday morning. So we hope to come back to the commission at your next meeting on November eighth. Hopefully, having resolved any of those questions and comments from Natural Heritage, and and be back with you on the eighth. Okay. Thanks. Bruce? Dave, were any of the comments in, in that extensively long email problematic? Um, I, I think they're all, um, I think they're all, they're all doable. We, we just need to talk through a little bit of their rationale. I mean, you know, it is okay. a site, as we all know, wetlands, floodplain estimated priority habitat. We know we've got a lot of critters out there that that um, are are important. Um, so we've got to just make sure we we design around them and protect them because we are inviting people onto the site in a different way than people were when it was a golf course. I I still believe that the way this core this property is going to be managed will still be better ultimately for for the environment than a manicured 150 acre site. We're certainly not going to be doing that. We are not going to be applying herbicides, pesticides. We're not going to be mowing, you know, dozens and dozens of acres of of uh, land every week. So there's lots of reasons why this is going to be a positive. But I, I get why they are concerned. It might also mean that we. Uh, for instance, the loop trail might, you know, one of their one of their recommendations is to move part of the loop trail a little further away from the Fort River, which makes total sense. And there's no reason why we we couldn't do that and shouldn't do that. And uh, they, they made a couple of other recommendations on trails that we're going to talk through with them. So I, I think we'll get there and, and, you know, the commission will get feedback from both staff and from um, Ms. Deanne at the uh, at Natural Heritage. Well, as, as the chair of the local Friends of the Turtle Committee, I advocate all things for the wood turtles. <laughs> um, um, is that a real organization, Bruce? Oh, <laughs> I just, I see. Dave, I'm curious, how long has the um, golf course been sort of abandoned out of commission? Like how long has that place been fallow and, Sort of. 2019. Oh, that's it. I, I, yeah, I, I haven't committed that to memory, but yeah, 2019 sounds about right. Okay, interesting. Well, nature, nature has taken its course out there for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah, I happened to interact with somebody in Washington D.C. last weekend, and they have very fond memories and. They started talking about Hickory Ridge as if it was still a golf course, and I had to tell them, "Oh, you haven't been to Amherst in a while." because <laughs> it isn't right. so anyway all good okay um all right if there's nothing else i'm looking for a motion to continue i, I move to continue the public hearing for 191 west pomeroy lane to 11 8 2023 at 7 50 p.m second on uh, Bruce on the first, Alex on the second, Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Nominee. Okay. Um, 
Next up, SW, it's a notice of intent for SWCA on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures in the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at lot 13, Olympia Drive, map 8D, lots 15, 16, and 3. So it looks like we have another continuation for this. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and ask if we've received updated maps. It doesn't look like we've have anything new in our folders. Is that okay? Bruce? So I drove out there the other day and Alex, the all of that material that is on the, I guess it's sort of the northeastern side that we looked at is all still there. In fact, there's probably more of it now than there was before. So whatever the attempt is that we're trying to make to get them to on their own move the stuff back from from the access to the vernal pool is not hasn't happened yet. So I don't know if Aaron knows more, but it, it looks the same as it did. Looks worse. Okay. Yes. I'm not sure how far we should go into discussion without the applicant here. Okay. But sorry, I just no, it's fine. Okay. Um well thanks for keeping an eye on things, Bruce. <laughs> Alex. I was going to ask a question of Bruce about something else you might have seen, but if you don't want to talk about it without the applicant, I'll put my hand down. Um, I mean, that's my inclination. Is that sort of on par with what you guys think, Aaron, Dave? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. We'll just we'll just wait until we have um, SWCA here to get further into it. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. I'm looking for a motion to continue. I move to continue the public hearing for lot 13 Olympia Drive notice of intent to 11.8.23 at 7.55 p.m. Second. Andre on the first, Jason on the second. Alex. Um, in Robert's rules, after it's been seconded, is there opportunity for a question or discussion? I think that would happen after the first motion, but um, I'm fine with you asking a question now. Aaron, in their PowerPoint, wants to know if the commissioners want a third party review. And we didn't talk about that. In yeah, first, I think, uh, um... So I think there's there's definitely some significant updates on this one, um, and I think it it would be prudent for us to revisit this once we have um, uh, SWCA at the table. But um, yeah, there there are some updates, and also there's there's a PowerPoint that I updated, um, which is relative to the um, potential violations that. Um, I had suspected on the site, so I would encourage you guys to take a look at that. Um, that should be in the folder. Just to kind of familiarize yourself with the, I did a ton of aerial research and also I did a permit inventory um, for the property to determine what had been permitted and not. Thank you. Jason? Uh, I thought we had asked them to I thought we agreed to do a third party over uh, review at least several meetings. This has gone back several meetings now. But as I recall, we, we requested that already. We did a show of hands to see where the commissioner's thoughts lied, but we didn't make an official request for that. The I mean, I don't know how what the applicant's position is on requesting that, but um we didn't yeah officially make um that determination but go ahead Aaron if you want to give some more clarification yeah after that meeting there was a a meeting of me Dave Z um the applicant and UMass and they requested and and I think they did request at that meeting as well to have an opportunity to do some more site due diligence and so um I believe that is in part why we're seeing so many um, requests for continuation because they were doing um, more site due diligence in terms of getting out there and collecting data and trying to get um, a more comprehensive delineation for the site. Uh, so 
I think they wanted to present a more comprehensive delineation to the to the commission at and at that time have the commission render a decision of whether to conduct a peer review or not. Um, just that's what I know. Yeah, there is a like sort of a lot of contingencies on further information being supplied to us. So I think that's where we left it. And that was quite a bit a long time ago and we haven't received anything new since. But I, I would agree that we should at this point reach out to the applicant and say, you know, we have, we've gotten eight new applications in the last two weeks, which is a substantial number. Um, and to say, you know, we're, we kind of need an update on where things stand and how much more time they're going to need just because it's taking up time on our agendas and um, has the potential to bog us down, um, especially on November 8th, like the, the timing of it is just tough. Okay, thanks for raising the point, Jason. Andre? Yeah, um, I'll just add to Aaron's uh, last point there that, that you just made, Aaron, is that um, that earlier on, um, SWCA did mention that um, that there it did talk about the timeline and complain that uh, uh, that we should have uh, taken a look at this earlier, and now the ones who are postponing it is, you know, you, is UMass or SWCA. So. Um, yeah, it'd be good to, uh, get this one moving along. Um, Agreed. So maybe Aaron, you and SWCA could have some conversations about timeline and, you know, what's on our plate coming up. Okay. Yes. If there's nothing else. Yep. Okay. Looking for a motion to continue the public hearing for lot 13 Olympia drive notice of intent to 11, 8, 2023 at 7 55 PM. Yeah, I think we did that. We're just voting. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> that was a, the, right. We did do all of it. Okay. So back to the vote. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, next up, we have a request for determination for Mike Lipinski and Phil Rich for confirmation of identified resource area boundaries and determination of whether delineated intermittent stream is subject to the town of Amherst Wetlands by law and regulations at 167 and 187 Shootsbury Road, map 9B, lot 61 and 63. Um, this meeting is being held required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended and article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of Amherst bylaws. All right, I think we have Michael in the um, audience. Michael, I'm gonna promote you to panelist. And do we have Bill Rich? I just see, just see Michael. Hi, Michael, welcome. You're on mute. Hello. Hi, um, Aaron, do you want to give us the, the five minutes? Yes. Um, so what their applicant is looking for here is to confirm a resource area boundary. Uh, the applicant submitted a report, um, a wetland delineation and report that was conducted by Ward Smith, a senior professional wetland scientist. Um, and it's for delineation of an intermittent stream that's located on um, Mr. Rich and Mr. Lipinski's property. All they're looking for is basically to confirm the flagging that is on the delineation provided. Um, there is an acknowledgement that there may be additional resource areas on the property. Um, and there's no work proposed in association with this. It is just to confirm um, the accuracy of the flags and to confirm that it is in fact an intermittent stream. Um, 
we did conduct a site visit on the 20th and just the timing of it, unfortunately, with the leaves having freshly fallen, the photos didn't um, really provide a great perspective. Um, and I can pull those up to show them to you, but I also um, would like to show you the photos from the summer when um, uh, it was actually delineated and the stream was flowing. Um, so I'll start with the photos from our site visit and then um, I'll share the photos that um, unless um, Michael, you'd prefer to share the photos and videos that you've um, taken, but I can also share. So these are the photos. And again, the, it's it's leaf covered. This is a um, the profile of the stream is really low. Oh, that's my mileage. Um, so this is this doesn't really give a great perspective, but I would like to, because the I think that the Im really important perspective here for this site is to see the stream when it's flowing. Um, and so let me just get back to um, the project folder so I can share that with you. So this is the stream when it's actually got water in it. Um, of course, this is a seasonal stream, so it's only going to be flowing um, during the um, time of year when we have rain in the channel. Um, these are some photos. And this is also a photo of the that's a little more clear of the flagging after it was after the flagging was completed. And you can see some of the stratified drift there in the in the stream bed. Um, I can share the um, delineation report that was submitted by Ward. I'm not sure what else would be useful, but anything you need me to pull up, just let me know. Thanks, Aaron. Michael, do you want to take five minutes to? Um, I, I would just say that uh, just some background on on Phil and, and on his wife and my wife that we've lived in uh, these two houses for 30 years now. And um, this particular feature, this intermittent stream that runs east and west through our lots uh, does go downhill to a number of vernal pools and other wetlands. And in the past, we've always kind of taken it for granted, but with climate change, the stream has gotten bigger and the channeling's gotten much deeper and wider, and the feature is kind of hard to ignore now. And uh, each year, it seems like the flow through this feature seems to increase in volume and in duration. And uh, we now believe that this stream is a, is a very important water resource on our properties and in our neighborhoods, and uh, we feel it needs to be treated as such. As Aaron says, we've consulted with the the town conservation commissioner, we retained a wetland scientist who delineated the stream, issued a report stating that it is a stream under the town of Amherst wetland regulations. And we're just looking for the Amherst Conservation Commission to verify these findings. Thanks, Michael. All right, Bruce. Um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that those pictures that had a road in them, that that is Shootsbury Road, correct? I'd or is it the driveway? What pictures you're referring to? Yeah, maybe we should go back. The pictures in both sets of pictures show a road in the background. I just want to double check that that is Shootsbury Road. Um, so I think there's there are two driveways. Um, there's a culvert where this comes out from the driveway above Bill Rich's property, and then there's a private drive where the water goes under um, and I can pull the um, photos from the site visit back up to try to get clarification on that question. Let me just. Yeah, while you're doing that, I went on the site visit. Um, I would agree that the leaves really, really obscure everything at this point. Um, so I'm actually saying that also just to caution anybody else who's going out and looking at things that 
um, the perspective that you might have right now, you know, it, it's useful to look at those previous pictures when, you know, there was no leaf cover on the ground because obviously there's like very poor depth perception through these these current pictures. Also, um, just for the record, Andre and Bruce both saw this feature um, when we were attending the Shootsbury Road site visit because um, it does go under the driveway entrance for the um, the ANRAD that's just north of the site. And and these are driveways. Um, but the other one, the far the, the farthest one, those are driveways that go on to Shrewsbury Road. That's all I'm trying to. Yes. Yep. Those burn. are private driveways. Yep. Okay. Alex, you're on mute. Alex, Alex, you're on mute. When Aaron was going through her pictures, I saw cobbles and also the picture with somebody's feet in them. I saw stones that looked like they were trying to delineate the stream. I take it those stones that were delineating the stream, somebody put them there. But I the the cobbles are washed, they're round. And I'm interested to know if the velocity of the water there is such that it has moved away smaller particles than those cobbles. Or did somebody put the cobbles in there to riprap the stream? It's it, it's on the base of the of the stream bed, but did somebody put them there? I mean, I'm interested more in the velocities of the water. Mike, do you want to handle that one, or if you know, I don't know if if Am, if if she could go back to her pictures, that would be helpful. I, can uh, that I think one. where it comes out of the culvert. Did you want the um, pictures of the flows or did you want the pictures from the site visit that was most recent? Site visit. Sorry, I keep going back and forth. Um, yeah, I mean, my suspicion is that those cobbles were probably placed by somebody and that they were, they may have been placed to try to prevent scour, but um because the the lower stretches of the stream were very sandy, gravelly, um, but I really don't don't know the answer to your question. They just look. It looks almost like a little stone wall was placed along there. Right. I think Alex was referring to sort of where it comes out of the road. I can't remember if that's a maybe from the early season flow picture. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. 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 I don't know. It's it's hard to tell if that's the na native substrate or not. That's difficult to tell. I mean, that's what my yard looks like when the water's washed away. So it could just be a lot of glacial till. You know, yeah. So, so given the size of those rocks and the fact that they're water round, they're water smooth. The there's a high velocity of water coming down through there. Um, and I can understand the resident being concerned with climate change is going to have more water when we get these downpours of three to six inches in a night. So, thank you for your concern. Andre? Yeah, this is right. Any other questions from commissioners? Okay, I'm looking for a motion to, yeah, sorry, Aaron. I'm just gonna put this up because it's a little complicated <clears throat> because it's a, a determination and there's kind of some caveats associated with it. All right, I'm going to move to issue a positive positive determination checking box 2A1, noting that the bank boundary is confirmed as accurate and the intermittent stream is jurisdictional only under the Town of Amherst Wetlands Protection Bylaw regulations. And two, only flags B1 through 30, B39 and A1 through A6 are being confirmed. And it is an acknowledged that 
there may be additional resources resource areas present present on the subject properties. Three, no work is proposed or approved as part of this determination and any proposed future work would require bank flagging to be surveyed and work subject to local permit approval. Also checking box five, the area is subject to review and approval by the Amherst Conservation Commission pursuant to wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws, article 3.31. Second. I think I got Alex on the second, Andre on the first. Aye. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Um, Aaron, did you want to say something or is your hand? Um, I would say finish your voting okay. and then I'll have. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Sam and I. All right, um, Aaron. I was just going to say that we should take public comment if anybody has anything to, to okay. say. Um, I keep forgetting that. It, sure. That's okay. um, public, if you have any comments, please raise your hand. I'll keep an eye on it. And who was the second on that vote, if I might ask? Alex. Alex, thank you. Okay. Seeing none, I suggest we move on to our other business. Um, Stanley Street pickleball courts. We bring a day back on for this one, or we just oh, I see comment. Um, Zachary Gless, I'm going to allow you to speak. Yep, can you hear me? Yep, again, um, I, I just wanted to. Unfortunately, I was tied up in another planning board meeting, so I wasn't able to be here at the beginning of this meeting, but I was the engineer on the um 28 Green Leaves project. It sounds like Mr. Kravosky was having trouble accessing this, and I just wanted to kind of follow up and see if that had been continued to the next meeting or if there's any chance to potentially reopen that this evening or if it had already been voted on to move it along. We did uh, move it. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry, it was difficult to tell what was going on there. Um, oh, yeah, no, yeah. I completely understand. I at least wanted to, to at least come in and then just state that um you know I, I wasn't particularly trying to blow this off i just couldn't get out of my other meeting in time to jump okay. on this one understood thank you so thank you yep Good night. um checking out folks i guess thank you thanks mike thank thanks. you mr lipinski thank you um do you want me to jump into other business michelle yeah. Okay. Please. So the the pickleball. There, sorry, Dave. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought the pickleball closed last meeting. Did it not? It did close. We were going to issue it tonight. Um, I talked with Dave about getting an extension on uh -huh. it because uh, we I ran out of time on the drafting of the order. So we'll push that to the eighth, and hopefully I'll have that fully drafted so that it's ready just for a very quick vote at the next meeting. Um. Okay, so other items, um, there was two requests for minor administrative changes to orders of conditions. Um, one was for 285 Sunderland Road. This is the site, excuse me, <clears throat> that has the solar facility and we had requested some improvements to the um, um, erosion and sediment controls at the last meeting because there was some pretty significant issues with their, um, with their erosion controls. Um, I uploaded to the commission's um, folders and I'll navigate to it and pull it up. Um, the applicant has requested, and this was kind of at my urging um, to stabilize the access road because it appears that the original order of conditions didn't require any stabilized surfacing on the on the gravel access drive, which I think is 90% of the erosion issues that we're seeing. Um, on the site at this time. So um, they they went out there and refreshed the erosion controls, but I told them, you know, we're gonna be refreshing erosion controls until the cows come home if we don't do something to stabilize the, the actual road itself. So they did come up with a, um, a proposal to, they submitted uh, an, a sort of informal email with a, a sketch and I'll bear with me. I'm just trying to pull it up and share it with you um, to add a, a trap rocks to, to take off some of the silty sand um, 
substrate that's on the access road and put down three to four inches of two inch trap rock on the surface of the the road. So this was this was at my urging and I'm fully in favor of it. I would just have two comments on this. The first is um, once they take up the sand and silt material that they should put down a um, landscaping fabric underneath the trap rock to make sure that the material um, underneath the, the trap rock driveway doesn't just um, erode underneath it. And then the other comment I have is that the, the problems that I observed um, on the access road were not just um, on the upper part um, here, but they're also on this part. So I would just suggest um, that we might <laughs> tell them that this section of the road is also a problem and that they, you know, if they're going to be making roadway improvements, they should improve the entire road and not just this one portion. Um, so that's the only comment I have on it. If there are any commissioners, any comments? No. Okay, well, I agree with the suggestion that they should improve both sections of the road once they're starting on the first section or the secondary section. Um, if the commission's going to approve this, there should be a motion, and I would really recommend the specifics of including the landscaping fabric underneath the stone and also th that we encourage them to install the trap rock on both sides of the access road. Okay, unless anyone has any comments, looking for a motion with um, silt liner fabric, trap rock, and what was the third one? Um, just the extending it for the entire extent of the access road. Extension, Jason? Yeah, sorry, I, I, I'm a little curious as far as the pictures that they sent. So they're, they're, what they're proposing in this informal email is this two to three inch rock throughout the entirety of this area that they've shaded green. Yes. Okay. And so they showed a few pictures of uh, some what looks like compost filter, one compost filter sock going across this road. Is that just a measure that they put there temporarily and that, that when they put the rock down, they're going to remove this? Um, I, I asked them to refresh the controls um, at the, I mean, basically right now there's pretty significant erosion issues happening on the site. So they, they completed the work that was associated with the order of conditions, but the permit is still valid. And so um, since the site's not stable and they're still experiencing erosion issues, they, they refreshed the, um, they refreshed the controls. And um, I think that's probably what they're showing is just trying to demonstrate that they re refreshed some of the controls. Okay. So then this trap rock that's put there, is this going to be, considered their final stabilization for this road? And are they going to be looking to close out their permit? Um, I mean, once they've achieved stabilization, um, I would assume that they'll eventually be seeking a certificate of compliance on the site. Um, but they have so many issues with erosion right now, they're not really ready to get a certificate yet. Um, so hopefully this will bring them a step closer to achieving stabilization so they can get their certificate. So aside from this road, there are other areas within the site that are having issues with erosion and are not stabilized. With, well, it, that's, you know, it's a really great point, Jason. So <clears throat> this is a, there's a, there's a stream that flows through here and there's actually beavers that are active. Um, and so what's happening is the, the actual bridge that goes across the site is timber matting and the water level 
continually fluctuates and it does actually flood over the um, access road timber mats periodically. Um, and so that's part of the problem with the erosion controls is that I think they're washing downstream and also the beavers are, um, they're actively creating these um, muddy um, berms and stuff throughout the site. And so it's it's really difficult and challenging to figure out like what is actually material that's moving off of their work site and what is material that the beavers are pulling in and globbing together like adjacent to the the um the access drive um but i i do think that it will easily differentiate what the problem is once they get the road stabilized because the the road stabilization issues have kind of complicated the ability to monitor the site because i can't really tell is this material coming off the access or is it just the beavers, you know, um, getting involved? And and I nothing's going to happen with the beavers. They're, the beavers are going to be in there. They're going to be doing their thing. So um, hopefully this will just be a measure of stabilization that the non-native or the, the human caused sediment influences will be somewhat addressed, but the beaver issues are probably going to continue. And so then how what was there how are we making the determination of when this site actually has achieved its final site stabilization so they would come to us with a certificate of compliance when they're ready for us to make that evaluation and probably with a an as-built plan that shows all their finished infrastructure that they constructed on the site that's generally sort of how it's triggered but once the site is, is stabilized and I can document that um, the work areas and the areas where they're they're using for access are stable, at that point, the erosion controls can come down. So that'll be kind of the next step. Erosion controls come down and then they can figure out when they want to come through with their certificate. Their erosion control shouldn't be removed, though, until everything is stabilized. Correct. And their sediment controls. Correct. And yep. I, I apologize because I don't recall seeing a SWIP for this project. Was that all described in the SWIP for this project? Yeah. So the solar facility itself was permitted and constructed prior to my arrival, which was over, well, over four years ago now. Um, it was completed over four years ago, the solar facility. The access road was existing so the there was never any stabilization required as part of the original solar facility construction process which i felt like was a little unusual um but they did come through with a notice of intent it was probably right before you started jason to um put in an equipment pad um and they were tying in a let me i'm trying to remember now it was um uh Oh gosh, what do they call them? The um, power pole, no? Yeah, they were putting in power poles so that they could tie in the electricity. Like a, um, I'm drawing a blank on what the terminology is right now. The, um, the tie into the grid basically for the facility is what they came through with, and that was the the last piece that they um, just got permitted. And so that's the work that's associated with our recent monitoring. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks, Jason. Alex, I think you were next. Yeah, I don't know, Aaron, if it's really um, necessary to differentiate what's moving off the site and what's being assembled by the beavers. They should look very different. Uh, you're well aware of what moving sediment looks like uh, that's being moved by water, and you probably know what a beaver scent mound looks like. Um, and also the beavers will deposit musk on the scent mounds uh, that are usually pretty close to the water's edge. And musk has a very sweet smell. So real easy to tell the difference. I don't know what it matters, but I thought I'd just clarify that. Yeah, um, from, a, from a site monitoring standpoint, um, it, it was unclear to me whether so I would agree with you normally that it was just difficult for me to tell some of the material looked like it may have been like trackings from a vehicle going up the access road that had been deposited on the bridge itself. 
and then in a flood washed down and those you know the material that comes out of um, truck tires that's muddy and globbed together can look very similar to the um, stuff that beavers the mud that beavers assemble and I didn't know if it had just gotten saturated and globbed together or if it was in fact the beavers so I would agree with you in general and I think that that's why this access road is the stabilization of it is so important so that it can be more clear when I go out there what I'm actually um, identifying. Thanks, Alex, Aaron, uh, Bruce. So uh, I apologize for being confused. I don't understand what the, the minor administrative change is that we're talking about. And the description of all this doesn't seem very minor. Yeah, so, and uh, this is a, a great question uh, from a new commissioner, and I think it's a good learning opportunity to talk about this. So when an applicant files, uh, when an applicant receives an order of conditions um, and they have a set plan that's been approved by the Conservation Commission, any change that comes before the commission is typically presented as a minor administrative change. And the reason for that is it's it's up to the commission to make the decision, is this a minor change that we can approve administratively? Um, or is this work significant enough that they need to come back with an amended notice of intent to actually permit the work? Um, <clears throat> I would agree with you in general, Bruce. Um, about sort of the uh, the impact of the work being being more significant, um, I I think I guess just from a staff standpoint, number one, I want to give them the incentive to do this to stabilize it because I'm really concerned that if we say, oh, you have to come back and file an NOI, they're just going to say no, we're going to leave it as is, and then they're not going to do the stabilization, and it's going to be a monitoring nightmare. <clears throat> the other thing is that just in terms of resource area impacts, they are sort of the way that they've described it is that there's there's no um, net increase in fill on the site. Like they're doing, they're removing material and replacing it with the trap rock as opposed to just putting the trap rock on, trap rock on top. So um, it's kind of like a, a balance in the cut and fill that they're proposing to do here. So just a consideration, but it's, no, it's, it's completely I, at your discretion. No, I see. No, I'm, I'm still trying to learn the finer distinctions. Thanks, Bruce. It's always good to cover that. Um, okay, so unless it's on the table that this is an amendment and not a minor administrative change, we're looking to make a... Okay, Jason, gotcha. Go ahead. Sorry, I uh, wanted to just comment then on um, Aaron's recommendation that we recommend a filter fabric go underneath the trap rock. Are we going to, um, I think it would be a good idea if we state something a little bit more than a filter fabric. If they do, you know, if they go and put something that's like a polyethylene silt fence and call it a filter fabric, I don't think that that's going to achieve the goal that we want. I think it needs to be, you know, um, more of a non-woven geotextile filter fabric as opposed to something like a, like a polyethylene filter fabric or something like that. It needs to be a little bit more um, significant because we want it to last as well. Really appreciate that suggestion. That's great. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we want to get into the exact specifications of it, but, you know, so I'm not exactly sure how to word that, but I just wanted to bring that up that we want it to be substantial. Um, Aaron, do you have, are you writing this on a screen? Yeah, maybe, um, I think we've collected enough sort of complexity here that it would be helpful to see the motion okay. and just make sure we're all on the same page with the conditions. Bruce? Either of our uh, attendees related to this particular topic? Raise your hand, please, attendees, if you want to comment on this. I mean, I don't, I don't have any names for this one, and I see no hands. 
Okay. Yes, public, if you have comments, please go ahead and raise your hand. We'll keep an eye on it. Sorry, I'm typing, bear with me. Um, does this capture the discussion? I'm happy to amend this. Jason, is substantial a specific enough word for you? Like, does it is that meaningful in terms of you know the specs of purchasing something? I think substantial is, an, is a uh, an ambiguous word. I think if you just state that a non-woven geotextile fabric, um, you can say if you want or if we want as a as a group to decide, we can say something like four ounce non-woven, four ounce or heavier, um, or six ounce. It, it really depends. I, I, off the top of my head, I don't have a great um you know i don't know what would be the most appropriate weight but i think stating at least a non-woven geotextile fabric as opposed to something like filter fabric would is a is a good a good enough recommendation okay maybe put an eg before the four ounce so we're not tying them to mm -hmm. that in case it's not exactly what is appropriate mm -hmm. Okay, does, every, does this look good to everybody? And if so, you want and... to six ounce. <clears throat> okay, I'm looking for a motion if everyone's okay with this. I will move to make the motion to approve the minor administrative change with the following conditions. A non-woven geotextile fabric, e.g. four to six ounce or heavier, shall be placed under the trap rock, and it is recommended to extend the fabric and trap rock for the full length of the access road. Second. Jason on the first, Andre on the second. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Nam and I. Okay. I don't see any public comment. Hands up. So, um, other business. Um, the Lincoln Ave Mass Ave incident. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. What did we do? Fifty one East Pleasant Street. Um, so there is a correspondence in the folder on this. Um, I did request additional information, and you're welcome to take a look at the correspondence. The correspondence was what I would describe as very ambiguous with regard to cleanup of the bank. And so I've requested additional detail on what that actually includes um, okay. from the, the applicant. And also I requested a planting plan. Um, so they came forward with like uh, suggested species to plant and um, and that they were going to clean up the bank of the stream, um, which included removal of vegetation, but there was no detail with regard to what stabilization measures they were going to use, what measures they were going to do to clean it up, like if they were using mechanical means or, or um, labor, like physical labor. So I'd like to get a little bit more detail from the applicant before we move on that one. Um, but I did provide the correspondence in the folder for your information. Yeah, thanks for catching that, Bruce. And and just to follow up on that, that we're talking about removing knotweed, and I would like more details upon like I, I think this is SWCA again, so they have their they know their techniques and methods. But I just would make me feel more comfortable to know that it's being taken out carefully and getting bagged and you know disposed of properly because 
without significant and repetitive and multiple kinds of treatment, it's hard to really see that going away. Um, but I, I saw their updated planting plans and it looked fine to me having not been there. But I guess we'll keep an eye on that once they come back with some more details. Yes. Um, okay, so the potential enforcement situation, um, this was made aware to me by our, um, uh, our electrical inspector in town. Um, she was out doing an inspection. Um, this is an order of conditions that we have for the, it's at UMass for the Lincoln Ave um, uh, apartments that are off of Lincoln Ave and Mass Ave. Um, and it's right adjacent to the Tan Brook. Um, the, I'm just trying to make sure I get to the right folder here. Um, the, the situation was pretty, uh, why am I not finding it? You guys see it in your OneDrive folders, right? For some reason. Yeah. Did anybody not see this one? Just so we know how much to cover. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pretty significant situation of a, um, uh, a truck basically uh, full of asphalt um, tack uh, kind of burst um, it, between two buildings and uh somebody some company came in to clean it up and sprayed a very um a, um abrasive material um liquid material all over the road the transformers the sidewalk and washed everything into the um catch basins and um uh, it was strong enough that it took the paint off of the transformers and um I reported it to DEP, um, the emergency response division at DEP immediately as soon as I found out about it. And um, basically just checking in with you guys if you think that this is something we should issue an enforcement order on. Um, to me, this is a pretty substantial um, and egregious uh, water quality um, situation that should not have happened and we should have been contacted. Is there an Alex? Uh, Aaron, in your opinion, what they did, would that be contrary to whatever license they hold? Well, it's certainly a violation on their order of conditions. Um, there's a there's a standing order of conditions for construction of that um, apartment complex that is they're currently monitoring and the, you know, the construction is wrapping up. They're sort of doing their final site work. So it's definitely a violation on their order of conditions. Um, <clears throat> I would say that it's probably a a violation on a number of um, regulatory fronts, <laughs> like Clean Water Act um, being one of them, like a straight up EPA violation. I'm not, uh, that's not my area of expertise, but um, I think it was a pr pretty significant and, and also they probably used quite a bit of the material, the liquid material to get this asphalt tack off of, I mean, it's basically like a, um, uh, a tar. They sprayed it off of everything. And you can, you can buy five gallons of it at Home Depot, I think. Mm -hmm. But I was interested in, I didn't expect you to know, it was sort of a rhetorical question, but if there are, job is to clean things up they no doubt have a license to do so and might it be that they live they were acting outside their license include in, in addition to the things that you were talking about yeah i don't know who did the work um i don't know who i don't know who the company was that spilled the asphalt tack i don't know who the company was that did the cleanup this was um the electrical inspector went out to do an inspection of the transformers and said there was people out there cleaning it as she was out there and she said what happened here and they said oh this situation happened and she immediately took pictures and notified me so um i don't really know what licenses the individuals hold who did this work, but um, so, somebody should have known better. Yeah, my question comes from your question, would the commission like to take enforcement action? I don't know what, what my feeling is, yes. 
I don't know what the size boards of that would be within our authority. Yeah, we've, we've discussed several ways in which this might have been some kind of violation, but I think we have to hone in on what the enforcement is under a jurisdiction. All right, everybody's got their hands up. <laughs> Andre, I think you're next. Yeah, um, so why don't we take, uh, take some steps here? Um, what, now I'm needing, I'm needing some clarification. What uh, can we do to call in, if you would, or talk to uh, the folks who are in charge of this uh, this construction? Because frankly, what we need to know is, uh, you know, what, where, when, <laughs> how, and who. Um, yeah, we have a name on the permit holder, like a contact person. Yeah, okay. So yes. that would be their contractors. Yes. So is um, that something that we could then bring them in and, um, you know, make sure that they have all this information and, and find it out from them? Uh, let's get an explanation. Uh, you know, and I don't know what uh, what other agencies are going to be doing about it also, but uh, it'd be good to at least have an idea of where they're all going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, Andre. Bruce? My question was simply, did they actually have to clean it up so quickly? Was it, if it was just tacky stuff that was adhered to various things, couldn't they have waited and found out how to do it carefully instead of rushing in and pouring all this uh, toxic stuff to get it cleaned up? That might be a question for our contact person and also kind of brings to mind like the communication between orders of conditions and just you know, general on-site um, protocols and what's, you know, given to the contractors. It falls apart there sometimes. Jason? Yes, I'm assuming that this project is a SWIP. Yep. Is that true? Yep. So uh, I'm concerned that this may, one, be a reportable quantity uh, or a spill. Um, it's certainly a hydrocarbon, and depending upon the type and its use, you know, using it as tack as it's intended is fine. Once it goes outside of that intended use, that is not fine, and that may potentially be a reportable quantity um, that should be listed in their SWIP. If they discharge any of this to the receiving waters, right, any of the resources, then that's a discharge of pollutants. Um, you know, it would be like an unauthorized non-stormwater discharge. Um, so uh, there's a number of things from a SWIP standpoint. Was it documented? Um, did their responsible person go out, take pictures? Were they even notified of it? Um, and then what impacts did this have? Because it says that they cleaned it up by just power washing and that it went into the, if I read it correctly, it went into the drains, storm drains. Right, which drained directly did it to the go from the storm drains? Did those storm drains go directly to the receiving waters? Did they go to a basin? If they go to a basin, is this material still in the basin? And then if it's an infiltration basin, is that going to infiltrate in any groundwater? Um, so I think that there's, we certainly need more information, but there's potentially larger impacts to the resources and um, certainly some documentation that I think that they need. And then what was in that, what was in that water? Was Is it a solvent? Is it a degreaser? Are there other surfactants? because those could potentially have impacts to the resources as well. Um, and are they going to have to remove any soils that were impacted by these hydrocarbons then? Thanks, Jason. That's great expertise to have on this commission. Um, okay, Andre? Yeah, um, I, I'll just throw out um, again that I it, it seems like um, it seems like uh, the uh, DEP should be, if they're going to be um, 
investigating it in some way, then they would be taking some samples, I'd imagine, down further down to Tan Brook. Um, if not, then it may be something that, uh, you know, if they're not planning on doing that, then it may be something that we would want to uh, try to get ahead of. And otherwise, I do agree that, uh, you know, at least uh, to start out with, uh, it, it looks like there should be some kind of enforcement done on this. I don't know if anyone's actually just mentioned that or not, but. <clears throat> So the other thing that strikes me is that, okay, so this, this vehicle came and it made a spill. It was attempting to do something as part of the construction. And so is there sufficiently uh, stop work orders to prevent them from just bringing another truck to try to accomplish the thing they didn't accomplish the first time? And that that's at least partially why they tried to clean it up fast so they could get in there and, and do whatever they were going to do the first time around. And do we know if they've stopped work? For what do we know about that? Yeah, I found out about it um, <laughs> yesterday at the end of the day. So this is all very um, new. And um, yeah, I, I need to do more data collection and also um, make contact with appropriate um, agencies to get more information. But I do think that in light of the fact that we're aware of it, it wouldn't hurt to to document it in some way um, and put in writing the fact of, you know, we believe that a, a resource area was altered. There are catch basins. I agree with Jason, like we need to, to find out if these catch basins still have the material in them and or if there was an actual discharge to the tan um, and where that discharge point is so that it can be looked into. I know emergency response was out there from DEP. So this is a lot of what they, they do to, to look into it, but I agree there's a SWIP on the site. So there's, you know, there's multiple points of potential violation and um, uh, response action. So um, if the commission isn't comfortable issuing enforcement right now, um, I can do a little bit more investigation. Um, I am a little concerned because our upcoming meeting is, is extremely um, <clears throat> intense. And so uh, piling this on to a future meeting, I think is going to be challenging um but i'll defer to you whether you want to act tonight on issuing something or if you'd prefer to wait until the next meeting to well i think what we were wondering is what's the authority under which we we give the um enforcement order and it you know based on what jason was saying it sounds like this the swip is is that well, it no. would be it would be our order of conditions, okay. the wetlands a violation of the Wetlands Protection Act in our local wetland protection bylaw. Um, as far as the the SWIP, um, you know, we can certainly mention um, that there are other um, entities that are receiving um, inspections on this, and I'm copied on the SWIP, so I can look into that a little bit more and find out where they're at with their SWIP inspections and and get a, try to get a copy and find out if they've reported this. Um, but I mean, it's it's from the Wetland Protection Act side and our local bylaw side that the enforcement would be issued. And it would be for the potential alteration of a resource area from this activity. Okay, Jason. The alteration being the introduction of these pollutants or Do we want to do a, a raise a show of hands at who's in favor of issuing an order of conditions? I mean, sorry, uh, enforcement order. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, I see three, four. Andre, I don't see your hand. Is there any comment you want to? Give yeah, I just uh, I'm I'm kind of more of a proponent of uh, of being able to prove it first before we issue it, no? That's a good point. Is is there a lack of, I don't know, how do we do that then? Yeah, I mean, the samples? alteration, is, well, how do we prove the, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just thinking uh, the the alteration needs to be proved, right? Isn't that what uh, what we're gonna try to enforce? So then we, how do we do that? Uh, yeah. And I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, 
<clears throat> so generally, so it's a little bit difficult. I agree. Like ordinarily you would do sort of some site investigation. And in this case, we do have sort of some information on the situation, but not a comprehensive picture. A lot of times commissions will issue an enforcement order and state that we know that a violation has been committed and we're in the process of doing additional research to find out the extent of the violation, um, just to sort of put them on notice that we're aware of it and um, get their attention and also let them know that they need to cease and desist because in part and parcel, the enforcement order serves as a cease and desist order. Um, but it's not always that when you issue, it's not like, so for example, when enforcement um, occurs, because it serves as a cease and desist, we don't always have all of the information when the enforcement order is issued. And a lot of times the enforcement order will be ratified as additional information is gathered and collected. And we have sort of more details with regard to the extent of the um, violation. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it could go both ways, but I do think that issuing an enforcement order would get their attention and also sort of trigger them to start looking into this, um, you know, um, more uh, comprehensive way so that they're not just brushing it off and we're saying, oh, hey, we want more information via email. This is a pretty substantial situation. All right. So given given what you're explaining, I'd be a, uh, I'd be an I. Chris? Just as an administrative sidebar, is there any mechanism within our work where we could have an emergency additional meeting so that we could do what we needed to do without burdening the next regular meeting? That's a great point. Um, and as we move into December, we might need to discuss that because um, I'm just going to pull up my screen. I'm sure you guys have already seen this, but the upcoming um, meeting in November yeah. is uh, yeah. going to be substantial and it, it's going to be tough for us to handle some of these um, other, you know, our, our normal other business items when we're dealing with uh, this level of um, business. Alex? I was going to wait uh, to bring this up, but since we're talking about next meeting, um, I will not be available from November 1 to the number 12, November 12, and I'll be in a country which may not even have Wi-Fi that I can get to the United States. So I won't be available for meetings of the CONCOM or the subcommittee during that time frame. Okay, and um, maybe that will affect an emergency meeting if we have to ratify something, but um, okay. It may affect you having a forum. Okay, what was the date? The 12th, you said, of November? I fly on November 1 and I come back on November 12th. Okay, well, that gives us some time to have an emergency meeting if we need to. Um, yeah. As to I, emergency meetings, I... I suggest that we fit whatever we need to do into our schedule. And it's entirely possible that we get deluged with more than we can handle in our regular schedule. And that's just life. Okay. Well, let's try and finish this one for today. Um, all right. So at hand is um, deciding if we're going to issue an order of conditions and what kind it's going to be, Aaron, whether this is, yeah. Do you want to just explain that so we can figure out which the avenue like so, if... so it would be an enforcement order and um the enforcement order so there's a couple ways that you can go about with the enforcement order you you issue a cease and desist and say no further work related to this can occur until we're able to collect more information um you can also tell them that they're required to file an after the fact notice of intent um to basically um deal with uh to to provide us with a report um, as to what occurred on the site and also what the um, cleanup and remedia remedial actions will be related to the to the spillage that occurred. Um, and or we could ask them to attend an upcoming meeting to provide us with additional information um, regarding like a report of exactly what occurred, who did the work, why it was done, what the ramifications were. And at that point, we could get more sort of agency input from any investigations that have taken place since this happened. Okay. Um, 
I personally am in favor of that option too with the NOI um, to put some burden on them to, you know, just dis- mm-hmm. determine what happened and the extent of it. Can we condition it with some kind of like further testing or communications with DEP? Um, I just don't want it to leave it to Amherst to have the burden of proof on this if possible. Yeah. So if the commission's in favor of issuing enforcement order, I can, I am fully able to issue the enforcement order and I can sign it. And then um, I would say that I'll bring it to you at the next meeting for ratification and you guys can, that way we're not milling over technical details of exactly what it's going to say. But if, if I know you want them to file an after the fact NOI, I know you want them to stop any work associated with removal of any material associated with this and um, that we want them to come to an upcoming meeting to report to us exactly what occurred. I can include all those details in the enforcement and um, then they'll be aware that they're sort of on notice that we're aware of it and what our expectations are. Great. Um, Andre? Yeah, um, within that uh, report that you're, uh, that that we're talking, that we're discussing, I'd like to see um, an accounting of what substances were used and what volumes in order to uh, dilute or remove um, the uh, the tar. Okay. Alex? Yeah, um, my understanding is that the emergency order is not an arrest. So going back to Andre, um, it's when he said we need to be sure i think it sounds like the emergency order is a gather it's to put them on notice a gathering information and i'd like to know if this can get done if we can do something to approve aaron doing this perhaps in communication with uh, the chair so that we don't have to bring it back for ratification in the in the next meeting um so unless you guys you're you're welcome to to make a motion tonight and I I can run through this you're you're welcome to make a motion to issue an enforcement order um issuing a cease and desist related to the activities that have taken place um that were noted in the email that were provided to us from um from Tina the uh electrical inspector um come to an upcoming meeting to explain exactly what occurred um ask them to file an after the fact notice of intent to uh address the situation and the remediation actions and then also to provide us with an accounting of the substances and the volumes if somebody makes that motion i can it doesn't need to be ratified if you guys want to vote on it tonight and i can issue it and put your signatures on it All right there you have it commissioners in favor of what Aaron said. All right, I I can try if you want. Please. I move to uh, to issue an enforcement order. Uh, um, regarding the Mass Ave Lincoln Avenue uh, incident. Uh, that was documented on uh, 10 23 um that would include a cease and desist order uh, prov- uh request uh, the applicants to provide a uh, report on what occurred um to attend an upcoming meeting uh to explain to the commission um what uh what occurred as well and to provide an accounting of uh, of all uh, substances used and volumes thereof, um, as well as uh, Aaron, I'm going to need help with the last one, uh, uh, issuing uh, an, an order of conditions or um, after the fact notice of intent, requesting an after the fact NOI. Okay, Andre on the motion. Second. I will Alex, second that. Second. I think Alex got you. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. 
Okay. Um, that poor Tanbrook. So, um, all right. Let's post on that. Um, I think we've covered everything. We, there's one thing, the forest cutting plan. Um, I did. Am I missing anything else? Is that the last thing in our folders? I, have, I just had a yeah. question. Sorry, Bruce, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say I had one other question. Very simple, short thing at the very end. Yeah, why don't you just say that? So uh, we were all asked to comment on the uh, evaluation of the town manager. And on page six of his um, very long description of all the things the town has done, it talks about we obtained grant funds to complete the Fair Fairing Brook Restoration Project. Is there a way that we can get links to the information that this project, where it is and what the money was for? And just, I'm interested in the status of this project. Yes, um, we can, I can try to provide some information to you, Bruce. Um, this project was done on the Fort River Farm um, property, which also has the community garden on it and it's um, at the tail end of where the Faring Brook enters into the Fort River, um, a pretty substantial floodplain restoration project that was funded through a variety of grants um, and that was completed, um, I want to say it was like my first year, um, it was a grant that had been um, received by the former wetlands administrator and she saw it through to completion um, and so it was a effort to restore some of the water quality issues on the Faring Brook. It's but, implied that the grant was achieved in 2023 and the work was done and I had never heard about it. So um, we can yeah. talk about it later. I just yeah just was curious about it. Yeah. Alex Sorry. Aaron yeah. was that money was what you were referring to was the creation of the floodplain. Yes. Yeah, that was several years ago. There is a walking yeah. path down there. I, I am confused about the timeline, Bruce, that you've mentioned. So maybe we could just handle that with some emails offline. All right. <clears throat> but thank you for paying attention to all that stuff. It's on my to-do list. Um, it's very long, okay. this document. Thank <laughs> you. Just Maybe it's, yeah. Anyway, um, okay. The forest cutting plan. I just wanted to bring this up because NHESP actually had comments on this one and there's the potential take for two species. So I don't know if anybody went through it. Um, I did notice that two of their comments, one was related to the access roads. One access road has like five stream crossings and the other one has one stream crossing. And according to this document, the applicant has said or the, the forest cutting plan includes only one access road, but they didn't specify which one. So it would just be nice to see or hear and confirm that it's the one with only one stream crossing. And then there's a condition um, for which the activities only take place on frozen ground. Based on last winter, that's a pretty short time frame and almost you know isn't continuous for a month, an entire month anymore. And I, my question is, um, who monitors, if anybody, the conditions from NHESP? Because, you know, the logger's job is to log. And if there's not an environmental monitor out there making sure they're not skidding logs across the stream, like how is, yeah, how does that get regulated? Does NHESP like go have a a site visit? Anyway, those yeah, are that's my a, questions. That's a great question. Um, I've, I have already an email into Ali Akandi, who was the reviewer on this, um, who did the site survey, um, asking her to discuss the um, comments. And uh, I'll make note of the comments that you made, Michelle, to try to get some answers to it. But um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had some issues um, in Amherst with forest cutting plans, and I'm not... Um, I'm not sure how to, I'm trying to navigate this. I'm a little bit um, at the end of my, uh, I'm feeling a little tired, so it's a little hard for me to articulate this at this point of the night, but um, it's been challenging to say the least to um, initiate conversations with foresters and between the service forester and even between the state forester about some of the activities that are taking place on the forest cutting plans. And when I raise concerns, I'm basically told, um, 
uh, it's it's none of my concern. And in other towns I've worked for, I've been invited out on forest cutting plans to view them and um, invited out by the foresters and the um, and the loggers and the service foresters. So um, it's it's a very different in Amherst, very different environment. And I'm trying to get a handle on that. Um, so I'll work to talk with Ali and find out a little bit more detail. But in general, I have expressed concerns um, about the communication on okay. forest cutting plans. And I mean, my one of my big questions, is there any monitoring or oversight? But it sounds like we either don't know that um, and it's certainly not up to us. Yeah. And, and um, just for, you know, Bruce and Jason, um, the difference with this forest cutting plan, as far as the one I've seen since I've been on the commission is the potential take of two listed species. And maybe I could ask Andre or Alex to define that. That's a legally defined term. I mean, it, it, yeah, anyone wanna, <laughs> I can't think of it off the top of my head, but Alex, maybe do you have it? I mean, it's basically the destruction, killing, or, you know, ultimate. Take. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a weird word, but it means there's a listed species that's gonna be like fatally impacted by the activities. Is that accurate? For this okay. conversation, yeah. Yeah, maybe think, fatally is not I, entirely. I think, when, I think when you're talking about the word take, so you 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 mean the word take as in uh, what's what the law prohibits, right? Yeah, so I think that the language is something like the activities may result in take of these of two listed species. So um, you'll need to. So the important thing with these kinds of words is to look up the um, uh, look up the meaning in the um, statutes. statutes or more so in the regulations at the beginning of the regulations. So you have the MGL, for example mass general law and that's like a statute that's what the uh what, what the legislature uh, writes and then the agencies create their regulations which is uh the cmr and within those regulations at the beginning of the regulations you'll find you'll typically find one of the first uh, uh sections is going to be definitions and so that's where you're going to want to draw that definition. If not, then you go to the Black's Law or to uh, some of the law books. Okay. They don't have a permit for take, which they would need. So if their activities result in take, that would be illegal. That's as far as I understand it. And generally take is killing. Yes. Um, anyway, so just because that's a tricky word, but is important to know when we talk about listed species in Massachusetts, I just wanted to briefly mention that. Yeah. Okay, well, um, if there's nothing else, I'm going to open for public comment. We have one person hanging on. Please raise your hand if you have anything to say. I did get a text from Glenn, by the way, that he he was what did he say he said he had a problem getting in and was not trying to decline speaking he <laughs> okay. said he'll see what at the next meeting it seemed like he was just having some technical difficulties yeah. but um yeah I'm sorry mean, about I, that glenn um yeah i just kept trying to invite him in and it wasn't working so i don't know what was going on there um anyway we'll hopefully see you at the ne next meeting okay um i think we've covered everything yes any last Oh, Alex. So uh, are we leaving the cutting plan or is that is that buttoned up? I think Aaron's going to reach out with some questions, but we don't really have authority to approve or really do much except ask questions and have some comments. Is that correct, Aaron? Right, right. Um, well, we're aren't we within our authority with regard to take of the species? I think the, that's mass wildlife. Yeah, Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program would be. Um, I mean, I could certainly reach out to the forester and say that the commission is, well, let me, I mean, I guess my preference would be to speak to Allie first, address, ask her what the questions Michelle asked, try to get some answers from her as far as which access road is being done, bring up the issue about the frozen ground and also about the monitoring of the species during the project um, cutting. 
And then from there, I think circle back, um, you know, Michelle and I can talk offline maybe uh, about what the next step might be like potentially reaching out to the forester. Um, I think the site is sensitive enough and there's enough wetland resources that, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's tricky because, you know, I'm not always, because of my role, not always welcomed with open arms on some of these sites. Yeah, um, I'm not sure how doable it is to monitor the species, but there are other conditions like no driving or dragging things over the streams that, you know, once, once they're out there, like, you know, who knows? So that's just what I was wondering if anyone's going to follow up with that or yeah. they just sign off. Yep. Yeah, okay. I'll follow up and check and we'll circle back on it. All right, unless there's anything else, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Second. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you for a big one next time. <laughs> Rest up. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.